nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So today, uh, this is we'll be talking about heterojunction bipolar transistor, the current transport through such transistors, and this is lecture 31. In the last lecture, we talked about uh, drawing band diagrams, and there are three different types of uh, heterostructures that we talk about. Talked about, uh, you remember type one, right? That where the one smaller band gap just nestles in the larger band gap. Type two where it's staggered, and the type three is completely misaligned. And you can, you saw that depending on the situation, it could be depletion on both sides for type one. Uh, type 2, one side accumulation, another side depletion, and the third was both sides depletion. So there is lots of interesting thing go that goes on in HBTs that you do not really uh, normally see in uh, homojunction transistors. Now let's talk today about HBT and the DC characteristics. So I'll begin by talking about abrupt junction HBT, where one material ends and abruptly another material begins. Emitter is one material, aluminum gallium arsenide, base is gallium arsenide. All of a sudden at the junction the material composition changes and that is in contrast with graded junction HBTs where the material composition, let's say aluminum gallium arsenide 70 percent, uh, 30 percent aluminum and gallium 70 percent. Now, in abrupt heterojunction, that should have remained constant to the base emitter junction. However, if you keep changing the composition, gradually lowering the aluminum composition so that it changes over to the base region just smoothly, that will be the graded HBT, graded junction HBT. And that's really a very good thing, more difficult to do, but a much better transistor. I will talk a little bit about that when you have run out of steam even with HBT, then a graded base HBT where the base composition is changed, that helps a lot and not a lot, somewhat. Talk, we'll talk a little bit about the disadvantages of having double heterojunction HBT before, before concluding. This you would notice is an abrupt junction HBT because the emitter, the larger band gap emitter continues seamlessly to or continuously to the, to the uh, base emitter junction and then you can see a rapid reduction in the or immediate reduction of the band gap in the base. Gallium arsenide for example, aluminum gallium arsenide in the emitter. Now in this case you would remember that this is type 1 transistor because both the delta EC and delta EV both are positive in some definition in this particular way. Now what would be the current? What would be the current through such a structure? So let's go slow but remember first of all that this has an abrupt discontinuity in the conduction band. What type of current transport should we use here? We must use thermionic emission in some form at the junction. Away from the junction diffusion maybe. Where have we used this before? When we discuss short key barrier. Again, do you remember that there was a discontinuous uh, conduction band and therefore we had to match the two fluxes from the two sides. Now let's see whether we can understand why the electron current shown here in red with the arrow, electron current from the emitter to the base has this particular form. For a second, assume things are in equilibrium. Therefore in the expression for Jn, which is the last term, the last term in VBE, that's zero. But even the rest of the term doesn't look right. Ni squared over Nb, that's the minority carrier in the base, that's fine. V is the velocity, but what is that exponential factor e to the power delta Ec over Kt doing there? This comes from the following consideration. You see, do you remember that when you talk about metal semiconductor junction, thermionic emission at that point, that at equilibrium, the fluxes from the two sides must balance, that must be equal to each other. So instead of computing the rate current, 
which is the electron current from emitter to base in equilibrium in principle i could have also calculated the corresponding current from the base to emitter that two current must be the same in this case if you look at the magenta then you realize that why the current has that particular form because look at that ni square divided by nb minority carrier v is the velocity with, the, with which the magenta electrons are moving and of course the exponentially suppressing factor because unless electron have that amount of energy well it's not going go to go over the barrier so only the fraction that has that energy and above that is the fraction that goes over therefore we now know the current that flows in equilibrium from base to emitter therefore by detailed balance we know the equilibrium current from emitter to base and of course if you want to look at with bias how much extra current that there will be you multiply with qvb divided by kt net current you take out a minus one put the whole thing in a bracket then that's the net current that's flowing in okay now generally that is small so i haven't really written that minus one factor for j sub n what about the whole current now in the whole current remarkably enough here you, you see that I do not have any exponential of delta EV over KT. Why not? Because you see, once it has the holes have crossed over in the emitter side, well, there's no barrier for backflow, unlike the electron one, right? There's no barrier for black flow. So correspondingly, when you write a diffusion profile on the emitter side, this will simply be a triangular profile. The holes will diffuse from the end of the emit base emitter junction to the emitter contact. As a result, we have exactly the same expression that we'll have in a homojunction bipolar transistor. So you have this, and this is, you remember, primarily is the base current, and the one Jn is generally more or less the collector current. So you can calculate the gain from here. What is the gain? Well, gain is Jn divided by Jp. You multiply this thing throughout, so you do, uh, see that there is this ni squared, nib squared, and nie squared. That's the two factors in red and blue. That's what's coming in. But do you realize that because in this abrupt heterojunction HBT, there is this delta EC over KT that's sitting there. Now that's very bad. You can see that that will eat up in my gain. And if delta EC even let's say 0 0.2 EV, a small discontinuity. What is KT? 25 milli electron volts, let's say. So even 0.2 gives you e to the power minus 8. And e to the power minus 8, a factor of 100 gone right there. So this is a dangerous thing. Yes, you get a lot from ni squared ratio by increasing the gain, but you give back a little from delta EC. Any advantage from delta EV, you still have. So if you put it back, you remember that ni squared, the ratio of those two ni squared gives you delta eg over kt. That's the change in the band gap. Now, if you take back the delta ec, what remains? Just the delta eg. And so, at the end, in abrupt heterojunction, you do not get the full advantage of the band gap difference, only a fraction related to the valence band. That should be clear, right? This is a very important point that why it's simpler to process. You grow one material in molecular beam epitaxy, then change over or MOCVD, then you change over and then grow another material, very simple process, but the gain is not as much. So what do you do? Well, let's take, take out that notch that's really causing me trouble. Now, remember that we are expecting a full gain, delta EG over beta, uh, multiplied by beta. By the way, there is two beta sitting, so don't be confused. Beta on the left is the current gain. Beta on the exponent is 1 over kt. So, just, just remember that. And uh, But the point is that for abrupt heterojunction, I got a gain which has delta EV over kt, not the full advantage. So, I need to do something a little better. See? whether we can do that a little better. Now, now what happens for abrupt heterojunction bipolar transistor? You have a corresponding, you draw first a band diagram. 
then you look at the potential that's fine but the chi of x you see chi of x up to the junction which is a work function if it's the same material the chi remains continuous and constant up to the end of the junction and then after that the base also has a constant chi and this is the abrupt junction in terms of composition now if you wanted to do graded in a state then this is what you would do you would grade the composition so you start still with 1.8 let's say aluminum gallium arsenide 30 percent aluminum then you will gradually reduce the aluminum mole fraction right let's say we do it by 20 percent 10 percent and by the time you are at the base junction this is really a gallium arsenide altogether so you can see therefore the band gap will change continuously and the composition is changing continuously what is the price you pay the price you pay is during growth when you're growing that material so you have just finished growing your base mb by mb let's say then in order to make it graded you'll have to make sure that the composition changes slowly you're, as the film is growing you are putting more and more aluminum in and that requires very precise control because the source from which the aluminum is coming you will have to continuously tune it so that this composition varies continuously so that's a more complicated and more expensive process but if you could do that in this case then you get a tremendous advantage because you see this time the backflow, the magenta one that I had before, uh, I didn't draw it here, but you realize that if the magenta current wanted to go from the base to emitter, then there's no delta EC sitting there holding it back. This is exactly like a bipolar transistor, homojunction bipolar transistor. Electrons are injected in the base, you have a triangular profile, electrons diffuse out. If an electron wants to go in the other side, Go ahead. This, this goes just fine, just like a homojunction bipolar transistor. Therefore, the electron current I have, J sub n, doesn't have that delta E C sitting on the top, just like a homojunction bipolar transistor. That's what I have. Well, base current, no problem, right? Base current is exactly the same as before because I do not have any delta E C sitting there. Now, do you realize that these statements is not true? If I had type 2, type 2 had a staggered band gap and therefore the suppression, I show no suppression here for example for the base current, but in a type 2 there might have been a suppression for the base current, but no suppression might be for the emitter current. So you have to do it case by case and look at, look to see whether back injection is possible without barrier or not and then write corresponding expressions. Again. Well, no delta AC, and so I have the full advantage. I have the full advantage of this band gap heterojunction discontinuity, which is delta EG over KT, and this is a transistor that will have huge gain. Of course, more expensive, right? Because the material composition was more difficult to do. Okay, so that's essentially it. That is what Cromer was able to show long time back. He started early, but he stayed on and Cromer is one of those people, almost like Shockley, ingenious, the ideas he has, he has the same blocks to play with, you know, but the, the things he makes out of those same blocks is really remarkable. Time after time, his ideas are actually beautiful and as you stay in this field, you will, of course, he's a very important figure, you will see many examples of his work. It's just in the style of how people do things that makes work extraordinary. It's not what you are given, but what you do with what you are given looks like that people can make very beautiful things out of it. Okay, so why do I do HBT? I have explained that already. What HBT gives you at the end of the day, and I just want to uh, summarize, is that do you remember that the base doping, this is an NPN transistor, so the base doping is NA, and the emitted doping, ND. And if I didn't have this exponential increase in the gain because of the delta EG, then you realize in the homojunction, I needed to make the emitted doping larger than the base doping. 
that is what I needed. However, I can now invert it. I can have instead of ND being 100 times more than NA, I could make it the other way around. I could make NA, I could make NA uh, much larger than ND. Yes, I take a hit on that. Previously, I had a factor of 100. Now I have factor of 1 over 100 from that yellow factor, factor on the yellow. But delta EG, you see, do you see that? Previously, it is 1.8 in one side. And how much was it? Let's say 1.2 on the other side for that particular combination. 0.6 sitting on the exponential over a KT will give you a huge, huge gain. As a result, even if you invert the base doping, you still end up with a huge gain. And as a result, uh, that gives you a very good transistor. Physically, why that's happening? Because you are actually suppressing the base current by that band gap quite a bit. An emitter current you are not suppressing as much. As a result, you get this gain. Now, what does heavy base doping give you? Heavy base doping prevents punch through. Do you remember when you tried to pull the collector down, there was depletion in the base region, which was eating away from the effective base width. And as a result, there was the early effect. The output current was changing as a function of VCE. Now, all those will go away if you make the base very thick, uh, base, base doping very high. Moreover, you can make it thin because now the depletion will not punch through. So you can make it thin. And when you make it thin, what happens? Transistors become faster, right? Because W squared divided by 2D, that is how fast the electrons must go. So therefore, uh, time takes for the electrons to go through the base. So that's again a very good thing. And you can also reduce the emitter junction, emitter doping. And that reduces the capacitance. Do you remember where the capacitance comes in? There was this Q, KT over QIC multiplied by the junction capacitance when I was talking about 1 over FTA calculation. So anytime you reduce capacitance, there are fewer capacitance to charge. As a result, once again, this is a great thing all over. Okay. But this is not all you can have. You can have a little bit more, and sometimes people do it, but it's not all common. That is that graded base HBT, and this is how it works. So, do you remember that if you make a polysilicon emitter, and if you make a very thin base, at the end, you are sort of pegged to this value of gain, this particular expression of gain, and you know that all, all about it. Now, is there any way to sort of manipulate that velocity at which electrons are going? How do electrons go in the base, base of a uh, transistor? It comes in, minority carriers, it diffuses around, right? It diffuses around and then it leaves. Because it diffuses around, doesn't go straight. Therefore, you have this W square over 2D. It's not W over a velocity. It's W squared divided by velocity because it's going a little bit forward, coming back, going forward, back, coming back, and eventually leaving after a long time. Diffusion limited transport. If you could somehow make it drift limited, or drift meaning with the electric field, if you could have put an electric field in it, that would be great. Now, how do you put an electric field? This is how. In the base region itself, you can make the band gap variable in the base itself. Instead of having continuous one material, gallium arsenide throughout the base, you can also change the composition in the base region itself, and therefore your band gap will be changing. Now, this band diagram is for an undoped material because the Fermi level is sort of in the middle, and you have these steps as it's going through, making from a larger band gap, little smaller, little smaller, and on the other end, smallest. So, EF is right in the middle. But what happens if you dope it? What would happen if you dope it with, let's say, accepted doping? Because you have an accepted doping, the Fermi level must be parallel to the valence band, right? Like this. The same material on the left, but this time I have doped it, doped it with a, let's say, uh, accepted doping. In that case, the separation between Fermi level and EV, regardless of the composition, 
must remain the same, right? Because there's that delta between the blue and the black line on the bottom. That delta is do determined by the doping. This is that the same, you, you see? And so the, as a result, since the doping is constant, the separation is constant. Now, in order to accommodate the variable band gap, then therefore the conduction band must slope and it must slope strongly. Right? Now, this diagram is not 100% right, correctly drawn. What I will ask you when you go home is instead of thinking about this as a continuous, break it up into three band gap regions, three materials with three different band gap. Try to draw it. What you will see that on the valence, uh, on the valence band, instead of being in a continuous line, you will have little notches appearing as it goes back and forth, little undulating notches. And correspondingly, there will be notches also in the base side, on the, on the conduction band side. See whether you can draw the band diagram and argue why the notches in the valence band does not matter. But you should do that when you are home. Okay. If you now do this composition, now look at this, what has happened to the base. Base now has a tremendous amount of electric field. So, as a result, if you now put the electron in, well, it will not be going to diffuse anymore. With that amount of electric field, it is going to drift because the electric field will simply pull it on the other side and it will go fast. And as a result, you will have a higher performance by polar transistor. So the JN, that's the classical expression. This is a JP, a classical expression for the JP. But, and this is, you know, this is the gain. But look at that with Ni squared, I have put a bar on it. Do you see that? It's not very clear. On the numerator for JN, I have NIB squared bar because I do not have a constant NI squared anymore, do I? I have a continuously varying NI squared. So I have a NI squared bar and therefore when I look at the gain, I have a gain which is continuously changing. Now is this NI squared bigger or smaller than before? This is bigger because the band gap is coming down. With the band gap coming down, your Ni squared goes up, right? So corresponding to what I had before, this Ni squared is larger. As a result, I have larger gain. This is simply saying that the time I required for the electrons to go, that is faster. So for the same time, I can pump more electrons compared to the number of holes. And that is why this base transit time, W squared divided by mu E, that is much smaller than the diffusion time and that gives me enhanced gain, right? Because anytime you have a certain amount of charge that goes fast, fast very, uh, goes through the base very fast, that gives you enhanced current and that gives you enhanced gain. So the graded base, therefore, is a very important, a very important consideration, although it's difficult to do. You know, you have a 200 angstrom base or a 300 angstrom base region. To grade it properly within that region is not that easy. And so only desperate people or probably less desperate people, sometimes they do it, uh, but most of the time uh, you'd probably try to find some other way to improve the game. Okay, so that's about all about single heterojunction bipolar transistor, abrupt or continuous? Abrupt, because in emitter base side you had a discontinuity. That gave you a lot of things, a lot of good things. Now, what about the collector side? Well, on the collector side, uh, you can also have larger band gap. Just like on the emitter side, you have a larger band gap. On the collector side, you could also have a larger band gap. What type of transistor would it be? You will start with aluminum gallium arsenide in the emitter. Base is gallium arsenide. Well, the collector is again aluminum gallium arsenide. Now, what would it buy you? Do you remember from the last lecture that when we applied a large bias to the collector, then there was impact ionization and the current essentially increased abruptly and that we did lost transistor action. Now, do you also remember that the impact ionization depends on the band gap? If you increase the band gap, then it will be much later. The voltage that you can apply in the output 
will be much larger than before. As a result, increasing the band gap is a good idea. It's a smart and good idea. Now, why do you want to do it here, not in BIPO, in silicon base, uh, silicon transistor? First of all, in silicon, you do not have this technology, right? Of continuously varying the band gap, you don't have that. But more importantly, many of these HBTs are used in high power application, where the output voltage is, could be quite large. As a result, if you don't increase the band gap, then the thing might break very easily, and that's something then you cannot get the power gain that you need. As a result, HBTs for high power applications often will have double heterojunction bipolar transistor, but it has another advantage, which I will come in a second. First is this symmetric operation, because you know that base emitter, sorry, emitter base collector, if you make just one junction heterojunction, then you cannot flip the emitter and a base. You couldn't flip that anyway for silicon transistors also. Do you remember? Because emitter doping was large, base doping was little bit small, collector doping even smaller, right? Now you cannot make an emitter, a collector, and collector an emitter, right? You cannot do that because then you will not have, have any gain. The collector, which is now your new emitter, will have a smaller doping compared to the base. You will not have any gain. So therefore, a classical homojunction transistor is not symmetric, that you cannot interchange a base and a collector. But if you could do that, that would really simplify circuit operation. Many times the interconnections amongst the transistors will be considerably simplified if you could make it symmetric. It is possible through the double heterojunction bipolar transistor because now doping is sort of plays a secondary role. You could dope the emitter and the collector with same doping because you know, and dope the base very heavy, and the gain will come from the band gap. And as a result, you will have symmetric structure, symmetric operation, can interchange base in the collector, which is great. Now, there is also the no charge storage in the base collector junction, simply means on the collector side, charge storage is significantly less because the band gap is larger, Ni squared is smaller. Now, the point I, wanted to, and the final point about higher collector breakdown voltage I already explained, right? What is the energy do you need approximately in order to have a breakdown voltage? 3 halves EG approximately, approximately. And so, therefore, increasing the band gap helps you. But the point I wanted to make is this reduced collector offset voltage. This is a measure of the asymmetry. And let me explain what it means. This is a very strange thing that you wouldn't really expect. Now, if you think about the collector current as a function of VCE, the collector to emitter voltage. Now, you know how the characteristics look like. Why does it look like this, by the way? Do you remember? This is sort of the reverse bias side, reverse bias side of a base, this is a PN junction diode. Do you remember forward side is exponentially increasing? On the reverse side, the current begins to saturate. And why does the current subsequently increase? Well, that's because the emitter current is coming in and joining the collector current. So therefore, this thing, this thing spaces out. Now, if you have these characteristics, if you look at the left-hand side, it looks like all of them are going through zero, right? On the very left-hand side, it looks like when you said VC equals zero, the current becomes approximately equal to zero. Is that right? Well, not really. If you magnified this region, you will find that even when you said Vc equals zero, current is not actually equal to zero. So, you do not have, you have not put an output voltage. Had it been a symmetric device, you see the current from base to emitter and current from base to collector would have been the same because you do not have any output voltage. It looks the same. But because of the change in the doping, base, emitter, and collector are not the same, right? In normal homojunction, it's not the same. As a result, there will not be, there will be an asymmetry in the current. The current flowing from base to emitter will be different from the current flowing from base to collector. And as a result, you will have a net output current flowing in the structure. And that is something you do not want. 
So how do you suppress it? This will happen in homojunction. This will happen in single heterojunction bipolar transistor. So this is how to calculate that current. You know the J1. J1 is the base emitter current forward bias. You have, uh, I have written VBE. I should have written VBE, which is VB minus VE. That's all. J2, well, this time I'm not neglecting it because in this case, I'm really applying a zero voltage in the output. It is not like a large collector voltage where the back flow has been completely been suppressed, right? It's zero voltage. So this time I cannot ignore the back flow, the J2. Now you have done these homeworks, right? In the homeworks, remember there are equivalent circuit, Aber small model. In that case, for various bias configurations, you have you accounted for all these currents actually, J1, J2, and everything. Now throughout the course, I was just talking about forward active mode, where the, the output is strongly reverse bias, the input is forward bias. So I neglected the J2 before, cannot do it anymore. So that would be your J2. And you can again calculate the current, which is between VBC and uh, th that's the current flow on the side. And uh, uh, the current J3 will co correspondingly have a structure. Now, let me assume that this is asymmetric. That is, you have J3 either to the emitter or to the collector, but you have a current because the structure is asymmetric, right? So, in this case, one current will be larger than another. Now, what you want? the collector current flowing out. What will be the collector current flowing out? It will be J1 minus J2 from the electron side, right? Because two are opposing fluxes. And J3, which is the base current flowing out through the collector. So these are the three currents. Should I add or subtract? Now that depends on for the electron current. Do you see there is a strange sign here? This minus. Do you see why it should be minus? Because the electron current J1 minus J2 the current is going to the right, from left to right, and the actual, uh, sorry, the electrons is moving from left to right, but the current is flowing in the opposite direction. So therefore, when I want to collect it with J3, J3, what is J3? That's the whole current. And when whole current moves to left to right, it really, the, I'm sorry, when the whole flux moves to from uh, left to right, in that case, the whole current as well moves from left to right. So do you see why, therefore, I must have just J1, J2, and J3 in this particular configuration. If you just look at the fluxes, I should have added a plus sign at J3. But you get the idea, right? OK, now in order to get zero output current, what voltage at which the current becomes zero? Because we know that at zero VCE, current is not zero. So I have to put some voltage so that the current becomes zero. What voltage is that? So let's do that. Now, if you do that, you know, set those three currents and sum them to zero, you will get an expression like this. It sort of makes sense, right? You can see all the NIB squared and NIC squared, those are appearing. You see that there is no NIE squared because I'm just summing up the current on the collector side. So I don't have those, those factors. Now, how can I make, uh, you can work it out when you have a few extra moments, but how can I make, what's my goal? My goal is to make the offset voltage as close to zero as possible, because then I can invert the emitter to collector, right? I can invert it. I have symmetric operation. How do you have that? What do I need? I need the gamma R to be very large. If I could make the gamma R very large, then you see I will have just a log of 1, log of 1 is 0, and therefore I will have the offset voltage equal to 0, which is what I want. Now, how do I make the gamma R, which is the reverse gain, how do I make it large? Well, you can see, just like the emitter to base, by making the emitter uh, junction larger, uh, emitter band gap larger, I was able to increase the gain. Correspondingly, by making the collector junction larger, for the reverse flow, I can increase the gain, but this gain is gamma R. So therefore, by increasing the emit collector uh, band gap, I can increase gamma R and make the whole thing disappear, this offset voltage disappear. Do you see why, why it's coming in? Okay. I'm sorry. 
Uh, do you see where it's coming in? Because you see NIB squared and now you have NIC squared, right? And from here, if NIC has a larger band gap, then what would happen? This NIB and NIC squared, that will again will give you e to the power delta EG over KT, right? Now between base and a collective. And as a result, this will become a huge factor. Gamma R will become a huge factor. The offset voltage will disappear and the transistor will become symmetric that will simplify your interconnections as you are connecting one transistor to the next. Okay, so I'll just end with a few comments about modern design uh, in the next few minutes. So at the end, this is the expression you have. Now, do you see how HBT helps you? Which term does HBT help? First of all, you can pump more current, do you agree? Uh, IC can be larger compared to, compared to, compared to before for homojunction bipolar transistor. Why? Because remember, I no longer need to keep the emitter current, uh, I'm sorry, the collector doping small. Because previously, I needed collector doping small. Why? Because my Bose doping was small my collector doping had to be smaller in order to control the RD voltage, right? So that the depletion goes on the other side. The price I paid for that was the Kark effect, that when electron came in, it flooded the junction and the junction was lost. I do not have that problem anymore. I can put a whatever doping I want in the collector side. If I do that, then my Kark effect can be pushed down at a higher current. It's not so easy with so much doping to overrun the junction. As a result, my current IC could be larger. If my current IC is larger, therefore the whole term will become smaller and therefore my FT will go up, right? What about the capacitances? By decreasing the emitted doping, you essentially increase the depletion. Is that right? You increase the depletion because depletion is inversely proportional to the doping. If you increase the depletion, then what happens to the capacitance? Capacitance goes down because epsilon naught A over D is the separation of the plates. So that goes down. If that goes down, this term will go down. But if you do increase the collected doping too much, of course, you are going to pay a penalty on the other term. So don't do too much. Don't be too greedy. But between these, you can see that you can now uh, drop this term quite a bit higher performance. What about WB? Because now you can increase the base doping quite a bit, so therefore you can make your WB much smaller without worrying about punch through, without having worrying about that these two junctions will short. As a result, your WB can be much smaller and that gives you higher performance. You could also do the grading, right? Grading on the base and that would have in, even increase that base transistor time even faster. So all around, this is a, a generally a better transistor. More expensive, of course, but a better transistor. And as a result, you will go much higher frequency. Kark effect will occur at a much later stage. So you should be able to clearly articulate. If somebody asks you what is, you know, how does HBT improve performance, just look at this expression. Think about it term by term. This has everything. Now, modern transistors are, of course, horrendous <laughs> because, and these are actually, many of them are commercial transistors. Uh, you have to have, look at this. I just wanted to give you a feel because what you just saw is not really the whole story. Uh, let me start from the top. Near the context, so it's the indium phosphide indium gallium arsenide transistors. Many of the lasers, when you talk in telephone, are based on indium, gall indium phosphide, indium gallium arsenide uh, tribe transistors. Why? Why is this indium phosphide? Because the band gap they have in indium, uh, th these transistors, many of that band gap is the same that you need for the laser. And that laser, when it pumps light out, that light must match the optical fiber. So therefore, because you know, light emission is related to the band gap. And so, in order for the light emission to do match the transmission window of the silica, 
which is this optical fibers, it must be done in indium phosphide. And therefore, when you want to integrate your amplifier and the laser into the same module, then in that case, this indium phosphide technology is very useful. So, in telecommunication integrated circuits, used all the time. Why is the top one indium gallium arsenide? What is it doing there on the top, 400 angstrom on the top? It is because if you use that high a band gap with the metal contact on the emitter, no electron will come in. It is such a big band gap difference. So, therefore, although everything I said is fine, your emitter contact will kill you. As a result, you want to start it easy, smaller band gap, high doping, so that the electrons can gradually flow in. That is why you use a smaller band gap, highly doped, 3 times 10 to the 19, 400 angstrom. What is silicon doing there, by the way? Silicon is a end dopant. Silicon is a end dopant in indium phosphide. Do you remember that table? Group 4 is silicon. If it replaces indium, which is 3, then it will become a donor. Do you remember that? So, silicon is a donor, and that is why this is like a N emitter of the side. You can see the indium phosphide, you can see the grading, right? Indium gallium arsenide, you can see in the emitter region, and then you have the setback region that 3 times 10 to the 16 is to increase the depletion region. You increase the depletion region, why? Because you want to reduce the junction capacitance. And also, you do not want the silicon to flow in in the base region. It is so thin, you know, you put silicon in, raise the temperature, the silicon, the end dopants might flow in the base. So, in order to prevent that, you have the setback layer. Is it a single heterostructure or a double heterostructure, do you think? It looks to me indium phosphide, indium gallium arsenide, and then indium phosphide. So, it is a double hetero, uh, heterostructure BJTs, right? And you can see it from here also, that you have a larger band gap collector, larger band gap emitter, and you have this base region. And do you see indium gallium arsenide on the left hand side to ease the flow of electrons from the contact. And then there are many other transistors. I just wanted to show you some of this so that you know how complicated some of the designs are. You will not find it when you go to work and this is already 10 years old. When you go to work, you will not see what I taught you. You will see things much com more complicated. But if you understand how to draw band diagrams and this, you know, this flow of current, diffusion and a drift and thermionic emission, all this are nothing, looks more complicated. It's nothing more than that. So you can see that correspondingly, you again have a double heterostructure on this indium gallium arsenide phosphide, that one. And on the collector side, you have a larger band gap. But you also see that they have graded the base collector junction so that there is no notch sitting there piling up electrons in, the, in that region. So, this has advantage of large band gap, but also um, uh, no charge buildup in the base region and corresponding with the other one. So, let me summarize. So, I tried to explain to you why despite all the difficulties, HBTs have taken over. And that is because it allows heavy base doping and allows you to invert the doping. Okay. And it allows moderate emitted doping. Emitted doping reduces capacity, is a good thing. Now, wide band gap collector has many advantages. I already explained, the one I explained is essentially was a symmetric operation by reducing the offset voltage to zero. So, uh, in beyond large breakdown voltage, that is a very important consideration that it gives you symmetric operation, simplifies. And band gap engineering, this is a general word that you will hear many times, where you change the band gap to get some extra performance advantage. That is what they call band gap engineering. And band gap engineering has many uses, but this one is a particularly technologically relevant one. And there are many other. Every time you go to upstairs or maybe in a bar, most of the professors are trying to do one form of band gap engineering or other, trying to manipulate different material. When they manipulate different material, they are actually manipulating essentially the band gap of the device. And by changing the band gap, you have many advantages. But this HBT is one of the most commercially important band gap engineered devices. 
Uh, we talked about uh, heterojunction launching lamps, which is this notch single heterojunction. So, in fact, you have a little extra energy to launch electrons from sometimes that helps. We talked about compositionally graded base. What is that? When you have a grading in the base region, it pushes the electrons quickly to the base, it increases the gain. And if you eliminate the band spikes, then you get their full advantage of delta EG, right? Otherwise, in the abrupt junction, what do you have? Just the delta EV, whatever was that, that part. And uh, so that's it. And uh, as I said, the most important research topic these days, if you go in any military research lab, you will see the uh, commercial ones except a TR, TRW and few other places, except that most of the work is now in the military and they are really looking at terahertz cutoff frequencies. And now that's not easy. Silicon is not going to get there. But there is a very good chance that bipolar uh, will, will uh, not bipolar, the HBTs can, can do it. It's not still a done deal, but perhaps it will do it. Okay, so let me stop here. Thank you.